join us via webinar as opposed to our scheduled seminar to OHSU. Um, I hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. Um, perhaps this time also offers you some good excuses um, <laughs> to have your significant other watch your kiddos for a little bit and, um, and come learn about some, some really cool technologies with us. With that said, we have a great set of talks planned for you guys. Um, we're excited to share how ACD, which is part of the Biotechnic brand, and Nanostring are bringing these powerful tools to our rapidly evolving spatial genomics field. Our partnership actually started about a year ago, and what we were hoping to do was combine RNA scopes reagent portfolio with nanostring genomics assays in order to molecularly guide high-plex spatial assays down to a single cell resolution. So the synergies uh, between the chemistries and the workflow that both these companies afford are, are, are two points. First, uh, Unlike antibodies, RNA scope reagents are universal and they can image on any unknown transcript. Uh, so this enables nearly endless combinations of cheap key transcripts that can be imaged to select regions of interest um, when doing a genomic digital spatial profiling uh, experiment. Second, the Geomics DSP offers only uh, is really kind of one of the only high-plex RNA spatial profiling chemistries that is currently compatible with fresh, both fresh frozen as well as FFP. So combining the biotechnies uh, highly sensitive FFP compatibility with the RNA scope reagents with spatial genomics applications can really extend um, to basic research all the way to translational and clinical um, applications. So excited to share more with you guys about that. Uh, during the talks, we definitely encourage you guys to ask questions. You can do so using the chat feature at the bottom. There's a little gray icon with a, a chat bubble around it. Feel free to chat it to everyone, or you can send it directly to Rhonda and she'll collate the questions for us. Um, and we'll go ahead and do kind of a roundtable Q&A session for you guys um, at the end of the talk. So really looking forward to your participation um, and just excited to share the content with you. Our first speaker is Dr. Anish Anishka. Deshit, she is an application scientist at ACD, and her presentation title is going to be Characterizing Complex Tissues with Spatial Genomics Using the RNA Scope Technology. Anushka, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, and as Brian mentioned, today I'll be talking about characterizing complex tissues uh, using spatial genomics tool, which is the RNA Scope assay. And after my presentation, Kiara will come in and talk about the GeoMix DSP technology uh, and how both of these RNA scope and GS, uh, DSP technologies are compatible and offer really multiplexed uh, solutions for gene expression analysis with morphological context. So without further delay, let's start with understanding what RNA scope technology is. For those of you who are not familiar with our technology, we are an in situ hybridization assay that was specifically designed to overcome some of the traditional limitations of an ish assay while still giving you really high sensitivity and specificity of detection. With this assay, we have three major components. The target scope design strategy, which allows to, uh, designing of a target scope against any uh, RNA transcript of interest, as long as we know the sequence. The second aspect is the signal amplification strategy. Now, this really uh, makes us stand apart from rest of the technologies that are out there because this allows for really high signal-to-noise ratio for an ish assay. And finally, our signal detection and quantification strategy, which allows visualization of a single RNA molecule as a punctate dot at a single cell resolution. And we offer this technology both in a fluorescent as well as a chromogenic platform. This assay can be applied to a wide variety of sample types, including FSBE tissues, uh, fresh and fixed frozen tissues, cultured cells, CBMCs, and so on. In addition, this technology can be applied for detection of mRNAs, long non-coding RNAs, uh, short targets, homologous sequences, uh, splice variants, point mutations, and so on. So now let's look at uh, 
a little bit in detail about what makes this technology so sensitive and specific by focusing on the probe design. As you can see here, the probe, the RNA spoke probe is detected as a single Z molecule, which is specifically depicted in such a way to highlight the three major regions of this probe, the preamplifier binding site, uh, the target binding site, and the linker region. As the name suggests, the target binding site actually binds to your target transcriptive interest. And the preamplifier binding site will bind on to the preamplifier, which then forms the foundation for your amplification tree. Now, these two Z probes need to bind in tandem to one another on your target transcript for amplification to occur. Once the preamplifier is bound, the amplifier molecules come and bind onto the preamplifier, followed by which the labeled probes bind onto the amplifier. This creates a tree that gives you high detection sensitivity, even for targets that are really low expressing. How does this assay assure high specificity? As I mentioned earlier, the two Z probes need to bind in tandem next to each other for the preamplifier to bind. If the two Z probes do not bind in tandem, then the preamplifier cannot bind onto the probe and there is no formation of this amplification tree. As a result, there is no signal detected. So this probe design strategy assures really high sensitivity and specificity, in turn giving you high signal to noise ratio. When we recommend customers uh, running RNA score, we always strongly suggest that they run control samples along with their test samples. Uh, as you can see in this first panel on the left-hand side, we have depicted our negative control probe, DAB-B, which is against a bacterial uh, gene. And since these are human samples, you can see that there is no staining detected. The second panel is our positive control probe, PPIP, which is a ubiquitously expressed target. And as you can see, the expression level for this target is very high in this human lung cancer tissue. And uh, using our red assay, you can visualize a single transcript of RNA as a punctate top. Finally, in this third panel, we have uh, our test probe, which is PDL1. Uh, again, you can see the signal here is very sharp, clear, and punctate. And you can actually visualize these uh, transcripts at a single cell resolution. Now, uh, this is what you would expect normally. For your test probe signal to have a level of signal uh, in between your positive control and your negative control. After doing the staining, uh, we have a couple of options of how you can do the data analysis. Uh, this is one of the most popular ways um, our customers like to do their data analysis, which is by semi-quantitative method. As you can see on your screen, here is a table which uh, gives you an idea about how to score your staining. Based on the number of dots per cell, you can give a specific score to your um, uh, staining pattern and uh, in turn, quantum, uh, semi-quantitatively analyze your data. For those of you who want a more robust and uh, more detailed method of quantitative analysis, we have also partnered with Indica Labs, uh, and you can use the Halo software to do your segmentation and do a more quantitative in-depth analysis of your staining. So we have both of these options based on your needs. Now, the RNA scope technology has been applied to two major assays. Uh, the first and the most uh, commonly used assay is the RNA scope assay. Uh, and the second assay, which is a sister assay, is the base scope assay. The RNA scope assay uh, is used for targets that are over 300 nucleotides in length. Normally, when we design probes for these targets, we design probes as 20 ZZ pairs. Uh, for the base scope assay, this is a more specialized assay mainly for detection of point mutations, exon junctions, and highly homologous sequences. And as a result, these targets are normally smaller than 15 nucleotides in length. And the probes are also between 1 to 3 ZZ. Here is, an Here is a, a slide depicting our product portfolio, uh, and it gives you information about all the different types of assays that we offer, uh, both on a chromogenic and a fluorescent platform. We have single-plex, duplex, uh, and multiplex assays. 
uh, as well as for base scope, we have single sex and duplex assays. So based on your needs and your uh, sample type of analysis, uh, you can pick and choose what assay works best for your research. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the RLA scope multiplex assay in a little bit more detail later on. When I talk about our partnership and joint workflow with Nanostrings uh, GeoMex PSP technology. Now let's go in detail about talking about the various applications of the RLA scope technology. We have been widely used for basic science research, for infectious disease research, for biopharma discovery and development research, and for cancer clinical, for cancer and clinical research. Today, I'll be mainly focusing on the applications of RNA scope for immuno oncology and oncology research. Uh, in immuno oncology research, RNA scope has been widely used for detection of immune cells by using a combination of different markers to identify uh, specific subsets of DC cells, NK cells, T cells, and so on. RNA scope has also been used to identify checkpoint markers on immune cells to identify different cell types that are found in your tumor microenvironment, including tumor cells, immune cells, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and so on. And by visualizing all these different cells and all the different markers together, you can get ideas about the interactions between these various cells and help uh, understand a potential biomarker and therapeutic targets for different tumor types. Here's an example where we have detected uh, PDL1 mRNA in different lung cancer tumors. And as you can see, the expression pattern of PDL1 varies significantly based on which tumor you're looking at. Uh, the positive signal here is your red punctate dot. And as you can see, the level of expression is quite different in these different lung cancer tumors, highlighting the really heterogeneous expression of this particular uh, PDL1 marker. Now, this is uh, a really impressive image because it shows you that PDL1 can not only have intertumor heterogeneity, but can also depict intratumor heterogeneity by showing different degree of expression of PDL1 within the same lung cancer tissue. And visualizing these expression patterns become very significant when the targets you're investigating are something like PD1 or PDL1, which are important immunotherapy markers. Now, in this example, we have analyzed a lung cancer TMA, and we're comparing two different cores. In the top row, we have our 2E2 core, or what we call the hot core, and in the bottom panel, we have our 2F1 core, or what we like to call the cold core. We have visualized the expression of different checkpoint markers between these two cores, and what we observed was that the level of expression of PD1, PDL1, PDL2, LAC3, TIM3, and PDL84 was significantly higher in this hot core or 2E2, while their expression was significantly lower in the uh, 2F1 or cold core. This is further corroborated by our um, semi quantitative analysis depicted in this table here, where you can see the degree of expression is significantly different between these two cores. Further, we wanted to compare if there was a difference in the immune cell infiltration rate between these two cores. So we looked at the expression of interferon gamma and CD68, which are potential markers for cytotoxic T lymphocytes, or COX-3 and CD4, which are potential markers for T red cells, or, or a marker combination that would either identify M1 family of macrophages or M2 macrophages. Now, as you can see here, uh, the level of expression of interferon gamma and CD8 or COX-3 and CD4 was significantly higher in the hot core compared to the cold core. Similarly, the expression of macrophage markers was also significantly higher in this uh, 2E2 or hot core compared to the cold core. Just indicating that the inflammatory signature was very high in this uh, 2E2 core, uh, potentially suggesting that this core might um, react better to immunotherapy. Now, an important thing to identify here is that RNA scope is able to 
uh, detect the cellular source of these secreted factors, which is interferon gamma, CXCL10, these chemokines and cytokines, which are indicators of the activation status of immune cells. So this is a very um, important application for RNA scope, where sometimes protein detection only shows you the secreted product, but with detecting the RNA, you can actually visualize what the cellular source of these soluble factors is. Uh, another great application of RNA scope is the dual RNA scope uh, ish IXC workflow. In this workflow, we have optimized a series of steps where you can perform RNA scope, followed by which you can perform IXC or IS. This workflow allows the visualization of RNA and protein in the same section. Now, this is a great application for people who are especially wanting to characterize specific cell types and then visualize gene expression within these cells. Or for individuals who want to compare RNA and protein expression of the same target. Uh, the natural complementarity of these two techniques allows for this beautiful workflow, uh, which allows you to visualize RNA and protein simultaneously. Here is a brilliant example of how we have used uh, this ish IF workflow to characterize a cervical cancer tumor microenvironment. In this particular figure, we have identified T cells by using the CD3 antibody. And within these T cells, we have looked at the expression of uh, cytokine like interferon gamma and immune cell marker like CD1 within these T cells. And we can also appreciate the single cell resolution offered by RNA scope in this particular application, where you can look at each individual transcript within a single cell. Similarly, this workflow is not only applicable for fluorescent platforms, but can also be applied for chromogenic platforms. Where again, in this particular example, we have used the CD68 antibody uh, to potentially identify macrophages and then look at the expression of chemokines and cytokines like IL-12 and CSPL-9 within this lung cancer tumor. Uh, here's an example where one of our customers have used uh, our LISCO to identify the cellular, mar uh, cellu identify the soluble factor list, which is important in uh, pancreatic cancer progression and therapeutic resistance. And using our LISCO, they were able to identify the cellular source of this secreted factor list and understand how the cellate cells and other cells within the pancreatic tumors communicate to potentially uh, increase uh, pancreatic cancer um, progression. In the same study, they used RNA scope and IS beautifully, again, to delineate the tumor margin using keratin-19 antibody and then visualize expression of targets like LIS and CD45 within these pancreatic tumors. Another great application of RNA scope is the detection of RNA scope uh, the use of RNA scope for detection of CAR T cells. Now, in the last few years, uh, there has been a lot of advancement in trying to develop newer and better uh, CAR T therapies. Um, we collaborated with Bluebird Bio uh, as they were trying to develop a couple of CAR T therapies and wanted to assess the preclinical safety uh, and specificity of their CAR therapies. <laughs> Using RNA scope, they were able to design a probe against the specific CAR vector of their CAR T cells and also design probes against targets like Danazine, interferon gamma, which are indicators of CAR T cell engagement. Here's an example of anti BCMA CAR T therapy that Luber Bio had developed. And as you can see in this particular image, mice were given uh, this anti BCMA CAR T therapy. And we are, we are looking at the mouse screen, where you can see that there is no expression of the BCMA antigen. And on your left-hand side panel, you can see the presence of these CAR T cells. But the absence of Janazine B indicates that these CAR T cells have not engaged in this particular tissue because there was no BCMA. It's showing that uh, these CAR T cells are not getting activated 
are in the absence of bantering. In this image, on the other hand, we are now looking at the xenograft tumor, which has the BCNA antigen, as indicated on the right panel. And when you look at the left panel, you can see that not only are the CAR T cells present, indicated by uh, the red marker, which is for the CAR pro, but these CAR T cells have now engaged, which can be seen by this really strong green staining for granazine B, indicating that uh, these, this therapy is very specific because in the presence of this BCMA antigen, the CAR T cells are engaging. And this is exactly what you want uh, for successful CAR T therapy. On the other hand, they had an other CAR T therapy for uh, ROD1. So this anti-ROD1 CAR T therapy uh, was, not as, was not as efficient and effective uh, as the uh, anti-BCMA therapy. And as you can see in this particular example, uh, what the researchers were observing was a lot of pulmonary and hepatic toxicity. But when they were trying to look at the expression of the antigen in these tissues, they could not detect any antigen by uh, IHC. But when they looked at RNA scope, they saw that there was indeed some basal level of expression of ROD1 in the lung. And as a result, you can see in the left hand side panel, the CAR T cells have engaged, resulting in pulmonary toxicity. Similarly, for the liver tissue, there was basal level of expression of ROR1 resulting in engagement of CAR T cells and hepatic toxicity. So these experiments uh, emphasize how significant it is to analyze your CAR T cell therapy and understand if it's effective, if it is having any uh, on target of tumor effect uh, to further take this therapy to the next level. Now here is an example where we have visualized the CAR T cells in combination with the endogenous T cells uh, with the CD3 immunofluorescence. So we are visualizing all T cells with the CD3 marker, and then we can differentiate the endogenous T cells in red, the endogenous T cells from the uh, engaged or uh, CAR T cells in green. One of the more important applications that has come out in the last few years is the use of RNA scope for detecting CDR3 regions on T cell receptors. With the engineered uh, T cell therapy becoming more and more prominent, uh, it is important to identify specific clonal populations of T cells. And to do this, we have to understand what CDR3 regions we want to detect on these specific T cells. So using our base scope assay, which is our specialized assay, we can now identify specific CDR3 regions on T cells to identify T cell clonal populations. And here is a brilliant example to explain that, where we have designed specific probes against the JERCAT CDR3 region and the CCRS CDR3 region. And we have looked at the expression of these uh, in CCRF and JERCAT cells. As you can see, a positive signal is only observed using the JERCAT CDR3 probe in the JERCAT cells. On the other hand, you can only see positive signals for CCRF CDR3 probe in the CCRF cells. Just again highlighting how specific our base scope probes are for identifying CDR3 regions. Here is a brilliant example by one of our customers uh, who used RNA scope to identify specific clonal population of T cells. Uh, this paper came out last year from Dr. Barco's lab at Vanderbilt, where they assessed an anti PD1 induced encephalitis patient tissue and wanted to understand uh, what population of T cells induced or brought about this encephalitis. Uh, they started by doing PCR sequencing on this tissue and identified a sequence that was um, expressed at the highest frequency. We then designed a specific gray scope probe against this PCR sequence. And using the dual-ish IHC technique, we co-localized the specific CDR3 to CD4 positive T cells and saw no co-localization of this CDR3 with CD8 positive T cells indicating 
that the population responsible for inducing this encephalitis is potentially a CD4 positive uh, T cell population. And later on, with further analysis, they were able to identify that this is indeed a CD4 positive memory T cell population responsible for inducing encephalitis. So you, this is one of the examples of how uh, our base scope assay can design precise probes against highly homologous short targets. One of the major applications of RNA scope in recent years has been validation of single cell RNA seq data. Single cell RNA seq has um, come up as a significant technique to precisely analyze heterogeneous tissues. And tumors, uh, especially being extremely heterogeneous, this technology has proven to be quite uh, efficient in uh, dissecting different cellular populations that make up the tumor and understanding their function in a tumor pathogenesis. But to confirm and visualize these cells in situ, uh, RNA scope uh, has been the tool of choice for validation downstream. This is a brilliant example uh, from a group of Howard research researchers working on glioblastoma, where by single cell RNA seq analysis, they identified four different cellular states in which glioblastoma cells can exist. And they have a specific marker uh, expression pattern for each cellular state. Now, by picking specific markers for each cellular state, they wanted to actually confirm and visualize the presence of these states uh, in situ. So they used RNA scope duplex assay to visualize uh, a combination of markers of different cellular states uh, in these glioblastoma tumors. But what they ended up finding was that these glioblastoma cells can not only exist as a single cellular state, but they can exist in hybrid states as well. So two or more states can coexist within a cell. And this is observed when they saw co-localization of these markers in a single cell within this uh, tumor tissue. And that was only possible using the RNA scope assay, where you get that morphological uh, context, you get that single cell resolution, and ultimately helps you validate your uh, single cell RNA seq data. So we have been adopted quite well over the last few years. Uh, from 2011, we have over 2,600 publications as of February 2020, and we have been widely applied for different research areas, including cancer, neuroscience, uh, infectious disease research, stem cells, and so on. But cancer research and neuroscience remain our top two fields of application, and we are seeing significant growth in the number of publications uh, over the last few years. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about the joint workflow of Geomex DSP with RNA scope to spatially characterize a complex tumor tissue. So nanostrings Geomex DSP and RNA scope have come together to provide a solution for spatially profiling a complex heterogeneous tissue like tumor with morphological and single cell resolution. I'm going to talk about how this joint workflow can be applied to your research, and then Kiara will go in much detail about the Geomex uh, DSP technology itself. <laughs> so here on the screen is an automated workflow of how you can combine RNA scope with DSP Geomex. In step one, you select your RNA scope probe that will allow you to pick your regions of interest. So normally in the bulk um, sequencing technologies or even technologies that you need to profile a complete tumor, it becomes cumbersome to do a whole tumor analysis. This joint workflow will allow you to only spatially profile the regions that you are interested in within a tumor tissue. So to start with, Step one is to identify the target gene you want to select for your region of interest detection. After that, you probe for your DSP Geomex RNA probe. RNA probe. Uh, after which, you will do your DSP Geomex profiling of specific targeted regions, followed by which 
uh, will be quantification using Encounter. And the downstream step is to validate the key targets that you have identified with your Geomex CSP profiling and visualizing them at the single cell resolution with morphological context. Now, before we decided to bring these technologies together, it was important to understand that they are compatible and are not interfering with each other's uh, chemistry. <clears throat> so, to address that, the first experiment was, uh, we did was to understand whether rna scope signal remains unaltered with GeoMix uh, RNA probe. So, as you can see in this first panel, where we did RNA scope only, uh, we see a nice signal of all the positive control probes. In the second panel, uh, we have now applied RNA scope probe and the DSP uh, RNA, uh, DSP RNA probe. And you can see the level of detection, level of thickness of RNA scope is unaltered. And negative control pretty much remains uh, negative. So this assured us that having the DSP RNA probe will not alter the RNA scope signal. An important uh, part to remember here is that the DSP RNA probe are not labeled. The second part, again, was to understand whether RNA scope probes are interfering with the geomix assays. So we did a similar experiment where we did RNA scope analysis, and then uh, in the presence of the RNA scope probe, we looked at the uh, DSP numbers with or without the RNA scope probe. And as you can see, the numbers or the signal-to-noise ratio that we get from GMX CSP analysis remains unaltered uh, in the presence of RNA scope probes. So this assured us that these two techniques can be combined, and they do not interfere with uh, the, chem the chemistry. Do not interfere with the analysis. Now the second aspect was to understand whether there is correlation between uh, gene expression of RNA scope assay and the GeoMex assay. So for that, we uh, used a tonsil tissue and looked at the expression of CD3 between RNA scope <coughs> and DSP, and then quantified both these analyses. What we found was there was a very strong correlation between the expression we get from RNA scope and that we get from um, GeoMex CSP. Another thing we wanted to confirm was that is there a correlation between not just similar genes, but different genes that are known to have pretty much exactly the same expression pattern. So we compared expression of CD20 uh, using GeoMix PSP analysis to that of CD19 uh, using RNA scope analysis. And we saw that there was, again, a pretty much strong correlation between the expression patterns by both these, uh, by these two techniques. We wanted to replicate this in uh, the lung cancer tissue, and we saw a similar correlation between CD3 or between CD20 and CD19 when we used these two different technologies. So that gave us confidence in the fact that these are compatible technologies and they do correlate with respect to gene expression. So the next step was to actually apply this joint workflow to a real life. Uh, question. So we decided to investigate the new cell infiltration uh, and the expression of cytokines associated with that in a lung cancer tumor microenvironment. So for that, the step one again was to select our marker for RNA scope region of interest selection, followed by which we would do digital spatial profiling using GeoMex CSP for those selected regions of interest. Then we would get uh, extensive detailed gene expression analysis for the target panel, after which we can select a, key, uh, a handful of key targets which are significant and show differential expression to then do RNA scope for validation. First step is to select the targets of interest using RNA scope. The targets we decided to select were CD19 and CD3. <coughs> As you can see, using RNA scope, we saw that the expression pattern of these two markers was quite different based on what region of the tumor you are focusing. So there was definitely 
uh, significant differential expression between these two targets. And that has to be expected since CD19 is a marker for B cells and CD3 is a marker for T cells. We went ahead and picked 25 regions of interest, 24 regions of interest, I'm sorry, for this lung cancer tissue and decided to further uh, do DSP analysis on these 24 ROIs. We took a mixture of CD19 rich ROIs and CD3 rich ROIs, and some that had comparable expression of both. Second step was to perform the high flex, high throughput UMX PSP analysis. When we did the analysis, we found that the ROIs that were high in CD19 expression showed similar uh, expression patterns for the targeted panel with DSP profiling. Whereas the ROIs that were high in CD3 expression showed similar expression patterns for the targeted RNA panel. And this was to be expected again because we are basically clustering ROIs that were uh, that showed high levels of B cells and ROI that showed high levels of T cells. And after uh, analyzing the data further, we found that there were a list of targets that were significantly differentially expressed between these two ROIs. So we went ahead and studied these targets and picked a handful of targets to be visualized using RNA scope and morphological tissue context. So in step three, we wanted to pick two ROIs to compare how differentially these genes are expressed between a T cell rich ROI and a B cell rich ROI. So we picked ROI six, which was rich in B cells or CD19, and ROI 11, which was rich in T cells or CD3. We decided to focus on the cancer immunity cycle since uh, these have markers that are important in immune cell activation and in promoting an anti-tumor immune response. So the targets we selected were CXCL9, CCL5, CD8, and interferon gamma. <laughs> this can potentially identify T cells and other uh, cytotoxic cells um, secreting these chemokines. Now here is an example of how the downstream RNA scope analysis for validation would look like. You would take a serial section and compare uh, the ROIs of your interest for the key targets of your interest that you picked from your DSP analysis. Here, as I mentioned, we have picked ROI 6, rich in CD19, compared to ROI 11, rich in CD3. And we can see the expression of chemokines and T cell markers was significantly higher in the ROI 11 compared to ROI 6. And this is not surprising since most of these are T cell markers and therefore show a higher level of expression in uh, T cell rich ROI. What was really interesting was these markers show strong um, corroboration with our DSP numbers as indicated here. The signal to noise ratio correlates pretty well with what we observed with the RNA scope signal. A second example was looking at some of the immunoregulatory markers, which can be important targets for immunotherapy. We included PD-1, PDL1, PDLA4, and IFOS-LG for RNA scope validation. Again, we used these targets uh, and compared ROI6 and ROI11. Compared to the previous set of targets, the expression of these targets between the two ROIs seem more comparable, although the level of expression of CTLA4 predominantly seems much higher in ROI11. Uh, but an important uh, distinction here is that the level of expression of these markers do not seem to be that different compared to the first panel. And that's because um, some of these markers are also expressed by, and some sort of some other antigen presenting cells uh, in addition to B cells. So that uh, was also correlating with the DSP numbers, as you can see here, which was again something we expected and was a nice uh, validation tool. So, in summary, I hope what we've shown you today 
is that using RNA scope, you can identify your specific regions of interest uh, for further spatial profiling using DSP. Once you've identified your ROI, you perform a targeted highly multiplexed GeoMix DSP analysis, followed by which you can select your key targets that are differentially expressed in your GeoMix DSP and further validate their expression with a morphological context using the RNA scope uh, ish assay. Both of these technologies are, uh, have very strong attributes. Uh, the GeoMix DSP provides you spatial or uh, high-plex profiling of gene expression analysis, while RNA scope gives you the single cell, single molecule resolution with morphological context. By combining these two technologies in our current workflow, we can have high-plex spatial profiling with single cell resolution and morphological context. So combining these two technologies in the joint workflow, uh, you're really getting the best of both worlds. To learn more, you can log into our website and listen to a webinar we did last July. Uh, we also have a white paper describing this joint workflow in much detail. Uh, we also present uh, our joint technology posters. Uh, we did one at SIPC and we're hoping to do one in ACR 2020. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me or our support or our support at Nanostring. Thank you. Anushka, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Really fascinating studies that you shared and uh, love looking at those pictures from both um, the RNA scope technology as well as the, the genomics. So thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, next up, everybody stay tuned. We're going to be sharing more about the Geomix DSP. And here to do that, we have Dr. Ciara Martin. She's one of Nanostring's product application scientists for the Geomix DSP. And her talk is titled Morphology Driven Hyplex Spatial Analysis of Tissue Microenvironments. Ciara, I'll let you take it away. All right, great. Thank you, Brian. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you for confirming. So um, I'm happy to be here and uh, appreciate that wonderful introduction. And I'll uh, get right into it. So for those of you who aren't familiar with NanoString or maybe have heard of us but um, not worked with us, we've been around for over a decade. We're based in Seattle. And uh, similar to ACD, we have uh, just shy of 3,000 publications, a lot of them in immunology and neuroscience space. We have um, bulk gene expression platforms, the Encounter platform that can be leveraged both in the research space as well as the clinical space. And we do have a um, clinical prognostic uh, assay in breast cancer called Prosigna. So we straddle both the um, research and clinical side of gene expression. And you know, we have been playing in the bulk gene expression space for some time, and you can kind of think about this. If you have a pile of fruit and you want to interrogate what's going on here, what do I have, you could blend it all up and make a smoothie. And if you took a sip of that smoothie, maybe you would taste a little bit of strawberry or a little bit of blueberry. Um, so, you, so you might start to know what's there, um, but you wouldn't know how many pieces of fruit, exactly, and, and maybe you would lose some of the, the um, more subtle ones like the kiwi. And so that's where single cell genomics comes in, where now you could, uh, for the last 10 years, you've been able to count the fruit, if you will. And you can know I have 10 strawberries and five blueberries, but you don't know the relationship of um, how everything is interacting. That's where the fruit pie comes into play and the Geomics Digital Spatial Profiler, which I'll refer to as DSP or Geomics throughout the talk. And this really allows you to resolve not only the, the quantity um, of fruit, which would actually be <laughs> your cells, right? Um, as interesting as fruit is, as biologists, most of us are interested in cellular interactions. And if you can know how many cells you have, what are all the different molecules of protein or RNA? How are they interacting with each other in this great matrix of the organism? Um, you can answer and address a lot more biological questions. 
And so the, some of these faces may be familiar to you. Um, you know, how uh, Gordon Mill is OHSU's own and Joe Beecham, our CSO, um, sat down together just several years ago and came up with this concept on a whiteboard and here we are um, with an instrument you know only only four years later and what they drew on that whiteboard that first day really uh worked from the the first time we tried it out on a prototype to the commercial instrument we have today and i'll walk you through the workflow here of how um the instrument itself works you take a slide that's been stained um with uh, either antibodies, if you're wanting to quantify protein, or ish probes, if you're interested in RNA targets. And in either case, that um, detection uh, moiety, the antibody or the ish probe, is con has a DNA oligo conjugated to it that can be photocleaved. So you take your stain slide, you're going to place it into the DSP instrument. And everything is going to be automated from there on. The first thing the instrument does is take a whole slide fluorescent scan. You can then see an image of this tissue and drop down ROIs for regions of interest, ROIs, on your slide. And the instrument will then go to those regions and shine UV light, causing the uh, oligos to be cleaved, that photocleavable Oligo has been cleaved and aspirated away from the sample, only in that region, not in any surrounding region. And for each region that is illuminated, um, the oligos from that um, region are placed into a 96, a well on a 96 well plate. And now you're just working with DNA oligos in a PCR plate. So you can either directly hybridize them to our barcodes and count them on the end counter, or you can sequence them using uh, the NGS readout. And I'll talk to you about both workflows in the presentation today. With the sequencing readout, you would have, um, we have different chemistry that is already canned and ready to go for sequencing. So we have all of the Illumina adapters in there and UMIs that you'll need for NGS readout. Thinking about what does the data look like and how how, how, do, um, how does my experiment look like on the DSP? Here's a simple example from the early days of DSP with a lymphoid tissue. And we placed several ROIs in regions that were um, rich for KI67 in green or CD3 in red or interspersed or intermixed. And if you're used to doing microscopy, this is kind of where your experiment would end and you'd quantify the fluorescence, but with DSP, this is just what you're doing to, to get to your data. And so um, within each region, you're gonna have highly quantifiable multiplex data. And this is one of our early panels, but still you can see in this region here where I have enriched KI67, I'm not just getting a confirmation of what I saw with my fluorescent antibody that the KI67 is enriched, but I'm also getting quantitative data on all the antibodies in this panel for the oligos that have been cleaved. And then we also have IgG controls and housekeepers in all of our panels as well, so that you can um, normalize and interpret your data. When we started doing DSP experiments, what we, we did what microscopists have always done, which is to uh, simply place circles or squares down onto a region of tissue. However, we quickly realized we could be a lot more creative with the, the approach. And that's because we have what's called a digital micromirror chip or a DMD, similar to what's in a projector in our instrument. And we have two of these. They each have a million mirrors and with the individual mirrors being about a micron by a micron. And we can change the tilt of each of these mirrors such that the UV light is reflected in a very specific pattern onto our tissue. So in this example here, I have a core from a TMA, a tissue microarray of a CRC sample with PAN-CK stained in yellow and CD45 in magenta. The instrument is able to automatically generate a mask based on this, these fluorescent stains such that it would illuminate this core once 
for pan CK shown in yellow. And so everything in white here is going to be illuminated together and placed into a single well. And then the instrument would go back to that exact same core and illuminate the inverse region so that everything in the tumor microenvironment could be quantified separately. So you have a lot of flexibility with your experimental design on how you quantify this data. It's not just a random placement of ROIs across your tissue, and then you have to annotate them later and figure out what's going on. No, with um, DSP, you can take a strategic hypothesis-driven approach to your um, analysis. And here is another example of um, a sample that was stained with three different antibody, fluorescent antibodies shown here, as well as a cocktail of um, DNA um, tagged antibodies. And the, these researchers were interested in inflammatory bowel disease, and in particular, these red mast cells, which you wouldn't want to have to do laser capture microdissection on. <laughs> that probably would be a very painful process. And if you dissociated these cells, then you would lose all the spatial context here. So what they did with their DSP experiment was have the instrument automatically generate this mass where all the cells that were red across this um, large region were illuminated at the same time and placed into the same well so that they were quantified together. So you can think of this as a cell type enrichment approach where you can enrich for rare cell populations across a region. And one question I get often is how big or how small of a region can I define? And right now, the maximum size of a region of interest is the size of our 20x objective, which is 700 by 800 microns. And then the smallest region is 10 microns. And as you can see from this masking strategy and others, it's very dynamic how you can um, choose to segment or draw these ROIs. So as we've been working with this platform over the years, some key approaches for profiling have um, come forward. As I mentioned, the geometric strategy was, is, is still a very common and straightforward approach where you um, place circles or squares or polygons across regions of interest on your tissue, or you could segment within those geometric regions to capture distinct biological compartments like tumor and TME enrich for rare cell types like the mast cells in a given region. And then I'll show you an example later in my presentation of contouring. But here we have a band of macrophage infiltrate and irritable bowel disease, and you can uh, assess immune gradients across the tissue or um, a, a tumor interface or something um, of that manner. And then uh, lastly, you could just grid across your sample so if you did want to, if you were interested in a discovery project, you could certainly do that with DSP. And I should mention now that DSP was designed with FFPE, formalin six paraffin embedded tissue in mind from day one. That's where nanostring um, has, has always played in FFPE because it's a very challenging sample. And so if it works in FFPE, of course, it works in uh, fresh frozen as well. And so we work with both tissue types equally well, whether you're doing RNA or protein as your analyte of choice. And um, you've seen some of these slides already, but I, I highlighted in the past few slides how you can use antibodies up to four. We have up to four colors in our microscope in the DSP system. So you can use up to four fluorescent antibodies to visualize your sample, or you could use for um, ish probes using uh, ACD's technology in the same workflow as DSP. So you could use these um, probes to visualize any targets that maybe aren't amenable to visualization with antibody, or if you have a secreted target or a CAR T, for example. And here's the example we did with um, CD19 and CD3, so showing that you can visualize with ACD and then quantify a large panel of targets that have been um, tagged, ish probes that have been tagged with our 
photocleavable oligos, giving you that deep molecular profiling of your samples. So I'll just show you a few quick examples of how people have already been leveraging this technology to answer different research questions. This is from David Rim's lab uh, out of Yale, and he was interested in predictive biomarkers of melanoma. And he had a cohort of patients who had received different types of immune checkpoint inhibition, and he wanted to see if he could find predictive biomarkers using the DSP platform. So he took one of our beta panels that had, uh, or, or early panels that had a cocktail of 44 oligotagged antibodies, and he wanted to measure different compartments within these melanoma biopsies. So he wanted to look at the macrophage compartment, the T cell compartment, and the melanocyte compartment from 60 different patients. So for each of these patients in his cohort, he took a single punch out of their biopsy and then placed it into a TMA. So his whole experiment was on a single slide. It was 59 patients with 44 antibodies. And for every single core on the slide, there was three illuminations. So there was three regions they quantified. The first thing they did was illuminate the CD68 region, the macrophage region, shown here in cyan. Then the instrument went back to the mask that had been generated for the CD45 compartment and illuminated that, and then lastly went to the uh, tumor compartment, the melanocyte compartment, and illuminated and quantified that compartment. And what they found when they put all the data together in an unsupervised uh, heat map with unsupervised clustering, it, it is more or less what you would expect to see, which is that the tumor segments clustered together and the stromal segments clustered together. And the macrophage and CD45 compartments were interspersed with very high expression of the majority of the targets in our panel, which isn't a surprise since most of these targets are immune targets and immune checkpoint targets. The tumors were more cold except for some of the tumor markers that we had in these panels. What was, I think, the most compelling finding of this publication was that the most predictive marker, or one of the most predictive markers of patient survival was PDL1, but it was PDL1 in the macrophage compartment, not PDL1. Um, in the immune compartment or the tumor compartment, which is where current companion diagnostics quantify this marker. So this is really compelling data and informative for clinicians who, uh, and pharmaceutical companies looking to develop um, approaches for selecting patients more accurately. So showing here the high PD-L1 patients having improved uh, survival when they have high PD-L1 in the macrophage compartment. And then several other markers came out of this study um, that were um, significant in different compartments as well. Thinking about how you could leverage DSP in a completely different application, here we have a uh, brain section, human brain section from an Alzheimer's disease patient. And this group, Stefan Prokop's lab was out of UPenn, was interested in assessing wild type versus TREM2 variants. And this is a known uh, muta mutation of microglia that affects how these plaques are contained and um, also affects the onset of Alzheimer's disease. So this these samples were stained for um, amyloid beta, a nuclear stain, and then astrocytes and microglia. Then the plaques were, um, we did a concentric circles around these plaques with um, each, with non-overlapping concentric circles that were illuminated and then quantified with our protein panel. What I want to point out for you here is that the Wild type patients had most of the expression of the proteins in this neuro panel was very high and, and overlaying the plaque. And then there was a steep drop 
of expression as you go to these outlying um, circles radiating away from the plaque. However, in the TREM2 variant, we see that there is a much more heterogeneous expression of the proteins in this panel, supporting the idea that the containment of these plaques is not, is different between TREM2 variant and wild type patient. And you could also visualize this data on a heat map rather than a radial plot. And what I wanted to point out here that was very compelling is that the, this clod on the left shows that the, the expression in the innermost cir circle is driven by location. So we see both um, genotypes clustering together based on location. But then as we go out to the um, further regions, we see that it's actually the genotype um, shown in pink and green that is driving the clustering rather than the location. So we're excited to say that we already have 13 peer-reviewed publications on the DSP system with um, two covers uh, for clinical cancer research, this was the melanoma example I was showing you. And in Nature and Nature Medicine, we had back-to-back -back papers, so two publications in both of these editions. So please look at our publications, see what's out there, and um, you know, we're happy to talk about those more with you. With regard to the content we have available today, we have both protein and RNA panels available with um, read out on the end counter. And the, the way that these panels are packaged is such that you have a core module. So this would either be an immune cell profiling core if you're interested in immunology, immune oncology, autoimmunity, and, or it would be a neuro cell profiling core if you're interested in neuroscience. And these core modules have um, the key targets for that fill, field, as well as housekeeper and IgG uh, targets. And then you can add on um, up to six additional 10-plex modules based on the biology that you're interested in. So here are the types of modules that we offer. So if you do the math, that's 80 targets. And then there's this custom option. So for protein, you can spike in up to 10 custom conjugated targets. So if you look at all of this content on our website and you see that your favorite um, target isn't in there, of course, we're happy to uh, offer that by allowing you to spike in custom targets. Now, we can either conjugate that ourselves at NanoString if you have a particular um, antibody vendor you like to use or you can look at AdCam's catalog, and they have over 6,000 antibodies, and they will do the conjugation for you and then sell you a small aliquot of that antibody. And then with regards to our RNA assay, we have an immune pathways core panel. This is an 84-plex panel that covers the immune and tumor immune um, environment. This with either whether you're doing the protein or the RNA assay, we screen all of these products in-house. So we're not um, purchasing antibodies and then putting them in a tube for you. It's quite intensive because anybody who has done IHC knows how painful it can be to screen through these antibodies and make sure that they're performing well. So we do that here at NanoString so that you don't have to. We do a post-conjugation screen making sure the antibody performs well after conjugation. And um, we look at sensitivity, specificity, make sure all the antibodies play nice together and then that they perform well in tissue. And we take a similar approach with our RNA probes as well. So that's what you can do with the end counter readout, which is um, just our uh, barcode chemistry that directly hybridizes to um, this cleaved DNA oligo and counts them. Or you can use a sequencing readout, which we're enabling in June uh, of this year. And that's what I want to talk about for the remainder of the talk. 
So the first panel we'll be releasing with the NGS readout is our Cancer Transcriptome Atlas. This is a uh, panel that has, is comprehensive of cancer biology with over 1,800 genes across 55 pathways. With this panel, you can add in up to 30 custom targets, and you can look at a variety of established gene signatures. You may have seen some of these in the literature, and we also have cell type signatures. And then the typical um, sequencing you'll need is about 30 million reads per sample. Here is another way to look at the CTA panel, the Cancer Transcriptome Atlas panel that we're releasing in June. It's kind of like a best hits of NanoStrings bulk gene expression panels that we've been selling. Um, these are three of our most popular panels, the Pan-Cancer Pathways, Pan-Cancer Immune Profiling, and IO360. We've taken um, the, the content from these three panels and combined it together to cover both immune tumor and microenvironment um, across, and it's made for pan-cancer uh, indications. So a simple example here of how you can apply uh, the CTA and how this data looks is shown with uh, a CRC sample. So this sample was a colorectal cancer sample. This sample was annotated by a pathologist for um, regions in the tumor center as well as invasive margins. And when you have this much data, at, at first it maybe seems like, oh, like if I have more data, this will be more complex, but it can actually simplify your analysis substantially when you do these pathway maps because now we're looking at the entire data set here mapped onto pathways. And when we compare these two invasive margins, something that pops right out at you is that this margin has got a lot higher expression if you look at my key here. So it is actively dividing, whereas this margin is, has gone cold and is not where the tumor is growing. So this is the type of information that'll just pop out at you um, from your data when you take these global type of analysis approaches. Another um, cool, cool finding that we had when, the, when we were validating this panel was we saw that this one chemokine was generally, so most chemokines were overexpressed or higher in microsatellite instable colorectal cancer. But this one, CXCL14, had an inverse um, profile, and at first we were scratching our heads and thinking um, perhaps there was an issue with the probe, but it turns out that this had actually been published several years prior, and the exact same thing had been seen in this journal article from Immunity. So this data has already, you know, we're seeing that some of the data we're generating with CTA has already been validated in the literature. So, you know, Last year, we were just introducing this RNA panel with the Encounter readout. This is what is available today with 84 genes. And now this year, we'll be introducing the Cancer Transcriptome Atlas with 1,800 genes with NGS readout. And then um, on the horizon for the future, we'll be having, we'll, we just announced at AGVT um, our plans to release a whole transcriptome atlas with eight, over 1,800 genes with spatial resolution. And I'll give a little bit of a teaser of what's to come here with the whole transcriptome atlas. One thing that is very unique about this is that we have the ability, because of the, the approach that we're using and the unique chemistry of geomics, DSP, we're able to just not have probes for the most high expressing um, genes and mitochondrial genes that aren't interesting. So, you know, you don't have to spend all your sequencing dollars and time um, sequencing these mitochondrial genes. Unless you want to, you could always spike them back into the panel. But um, you're actually spending your dollars sequencing what uh, is relevant to your hypothesis. Okay? And here's some ex an example of a volcano plot 
looking across the whole transcriptome for adjacent normal tissue versus neoplastic tissue. And you can see the expression of these different pathways within the tissue changing um, within these different regions of the tissue. Lastly, I'd like to talk about um, how you, you we, we've all been generating single cell sequencing data and it's very exciting and compelling to be characterizing these unique cell types. But where are they? What do they do? How do they interact with each other? Those questions haven't been able to be addressed until now. Where we're, so we're no longer lost in space with DSP. We can be found in space and we can take these profiles generated from single cell sequencing data and we can map them onto our DSP data. And so here is an example we uh, generated where we were looking at a cancer tissue that had each one of these boxes is a region of interest and the, it has been segmented for tumor and TME shown in red and green and each one of these boxes there was two illuminations and we were able to take the um, the data from here and map on all of these cell types that had been um, defined by single cell sequencing. And another way to show that here, where you can now see, oh, there's, there are my B cells, there's my T cells, oh, my macrophages are over here. Maybe um, some of these are more close to a necrotic region or a region of active proliferation. And so those types of um, uh, conclusions can be drawn when you have the, that spatial data. So DSP is becoming a key component in a broad range of translational and discovery-based um, technologies and programs. We have, of course, a partnership with ECD, which is fortunate enough to bring us here to, all together today. And then I mentioned AppCam, where you can custom conjugate any antibody for a DSP. Um, we also have a partnership with Leica so that you can do this in an automated workflow if you have a lot of samples. If you don't want to, though, you don't have to. So this can all be done manually. It's quite simple and easy to do manually as well. So a lot of my users I train on, on manual assays and it's, uh, it's just a simple IHC or, or ish assay that you're probably used to performing today. And then we have several partnerships in the academia um, that are helping us generate compelling data on this platform. Lastly, I wanna highlight, make sure I hit all the high notes. So one thing to think about is that um, you can use both protein and RNA with the DSP platform on serial sections and you can use FFPE tissue or fresh frozen. So we're pretty, um, we're agnostic there. You give us a sample and we'll run DSP on it pretty much. And uh, your sample is only touched by light. So you don't need to worry about it being ablated. You get your tissue back after you're run done running your DSP assay. So you could then validate the markers um, that you discovered were interesting. You could then do another IHC, so you could strip your antibodies off and restain that slide. You could um, do a variety of downstream um, studies on that slide. So you get, to, you get to keep that slide and use it however you want. Um, the, uh, the way you mask and your samples is very dynamic. So as I mentioned before, you're not forced into the paradigm of random uh, ROIs being dropped down onto your tissue, you get to determine how you want that uh, selection to be. Of course, if you want to do a discovery assay and you want to um, take that approach of, of profiling everything you can. <laughs> and it's a good throughput. So we're up to 12 sections a day. So you can um, clip right along on everything there. So that is all I had for you today. I'm going to um, and there, and I, we're happy to take questions. I'll kick it over to you, Brian.
Yeah, Kiara, thank you so much for that presentation. I get to I get the pleasure of watching these presentations often, and I find I'm constantly learning new things. Um, it's just really fascinating technology. Um, and the nice thing is, OHSU already has this instrument, and they're actually a center of excellence for us. Um, there's only a few across the world, and OHSU happens to be one of them. Um, thanks so much, everybody out there, for staying with us. We know this is a little bit of a longer um, series. Um, you know, we see that everybody joining here means the, technolo the technology and the talks um, must have been really informative, and, and we really appreciate the presenters, um, Anushka and Ciara. Thanks so much. These are wonderful.